Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us tonight for this debate dedicated to a conflict and the role conflict plays uh, in our democracies. This is our second fruitful collaboration with the British Academy um, because we organized a meeting here, a scientific meeting here, and we awarded our science prize last July in this very room, in the same room as here. I would also address our special thanks to Professor Colin Crouch, uh, former Vice President of the British Academy and uh, Professor Emeritus of Warwick University for his interest and continuous support through uh, the research and preparation of this uh, event. The, this debate is the opening event of the Conflict Matters Conference that starts tomorrow. And this conference, uh, the second of the kind, within, in the frame of uh, our uh, Peace Education Program, which is a key program of the Events Foundation, this conference uh, is organized with the Department of Education of the, of the University of Cambridge, and it will focus on the tensions and conflicts present in, present in our societies and on the educational policies and practices needed to work with conflicts in order to foster, to foster a respectful dialogue and open up to a process of a mutual transformation of opinions. But before um, uh, listening to the educational potential of conflicts, we are inviting you tonight to a collective investigation which matters lost to us. For the past 10 years, the Evans Foundation, with its peace education program, has been actively supporting educational projects in the field of conflict transformation. Why adopting a non-normative approach regarding the best way, what the best way is of uh, solving a conflict? And over the years, we have gained in expertise is educational policies and practices uh, which come from uh, the educational projects in the field of uh, conflict transformation. A lot of uh, theoretical hypotheses emerge from the best practices we observed, but we wanted to put them to a test and to base them on a more adequate conceptual and general ground. For this reason, we wanted to organize that debate on the reality and potential of conflicts in our society. So thank you again to everyone to be here, and uh, we are looking forward to your discussions. Right. Thank you very much for that introduction, and thank the Evans Foundation normally mainly active in France and Belgium, but extending their activities to this wayward island. Uh, and the Evans Foundation made this discussion possible and also the meeting they're holding tomorrow possible. And thanks to all of you for coming along. I hope we'll have a, a discussion that enables quite a bit of participation from, from those who'd like to take part in it. Uh, our issue is the relationship between conflict and democracy and how healthy that is being at the present time in our societies. Just a few weeks ago, I was in Vienna just after they had an election which had seen an end to a long period of a big coalition between the main centre-right and the main centre-left party. And this has been replaced now by a government partly of a centre-right party with a partner in government who, let us say, have an ambiguous attitude to the legacy of Adolf Hitler. And people in Vienna were rather worried about this. Uh, but several of them said to me, but at least we can have conflict again now. 
with, with, with the sort of centre-right, centre-left, middle-mass government, we, we lost sight of conflict. We didn't know how to have conflict. Then, a bit later in Berlin, where a, something a bit similar had happened, again, a fall of a great coalition of the centre-right and centre-left, in this case not involving Nazi issues. Uh, there again, social democrats who'd been thrown out of the government, they were feeling a bit sore, but they were saying, yeah, but at least we can def- find out who we are again, and we can define ourselves in opposition. And th- these two cases reveal the, the fact that we need conflict, and we need our democratic institutions to express that conflict. If, if we are just governed by a kind of jelly of the middle mass, then people feel that issues they have of an antagonistic kind can't be expressed. So you, we have to have conflict. It, it, part of the function of democracy is to, is to represent conflict. Of course, if conflict goes too far, people, can't, people hate each other so much they can't debate, they just want to lock each other up and shoot each other, then that's not good. So we, we depend on, on, on a kind of balance of conflict and the resolution of conflict for democracy to work. So then we say, well, what, what guarantees you get that? What guarantees you get a system that enables you to express conflict, but in a way that still enables you all to live together? Uh, and the answer is not that you can have a constitutional provision or a law that, that does it, because it, it, constitutions and electoral laws can't determine what party structures are thrown up from a society. Can't, they can't, and, and even more, they cannot determine what relationship the party structures and other institutional structures that get thrown up actually relate to the issues that are, are, are agitating and concerning citizens at any one time. So we're, we're dependent to a large extent, on the luck of history and what it serves up to us. Which means that every now and again, it's good to say, well, what actually is our history serving up to us? Is it at the present time in the various countries that we know about? Is, are our institutions serving up a kind of balanced structure of the representation and management of conflict? Or are they suppressing conflict? Are they expressing conflict too much? Uh, uh, and if we are not happy, is there anything we can do about it uh, uh, as citizens? Now, this is, these are the, the sort of questions I want us to address this evening, and we've got an interesting panel uh, to, to discuss it. Uh, Pauline Zambabiki from the University of Westminster, originally from Greece, so a conflict country that has its own conflict at the present time, but she is a specialist more generally on issues of citizenship. Uh, and democracy. Uh, Stretcho Horvat uh, comes from Croatia, he's a philosopher, and it was when he was a boy, his country was torn by the most violent and horrifying conflict that Europe has seen since the Second World War. And it's come out of that. Uh, old Yugoslavia collapsed, Croatia is now a member of the European Union, has functioning institutions. <laughs> more or less. More or less, <laughs> yeah, more or less, pure men. Uh, <laughs> Tariq Madoud, uh, the University of Bristol, sociologist. Uh, I don't know whether you were actually the person who first used the concept of multiculturalism no, in Britain, you were, but I always associated with you, right? If, Thank if you. Multiculturalism has brackets Madoud after it, in my mind, uh, and, and has devoted a, a, a long and important career to the study of multicultural issues and problems. Now, if, if you've got your program, with you, you will see the final speaker is called Saskia Sassen, but obviously we don't have anyone called Saskia. Um, uh, Saskia, unfortunately, couldn't come, uh, but uh, Richard Sennett uh, is standing in for her. Uh, he is not Saskia Sassen, and he doesn't really do the same issues that she does, but he is married to her. <laughs> uh, and that's why it was possible for her to get him to stand in. But we're very, very happy to have him. Was Richard, a sociologist based here in London, London School of Economics, and also in New York, uh, who has a particular take on social relationships. He, 
And I, I work at a very macro level of sociology. I just I don't ever sort of encounter human beings in what I do. But Richard really, I envy him because he, he really talks about how ordinary people actually experience the world, sometimes through the things they do with their hands, sometimes through the injuries they suffer, the wounds that they suffer from social relations. Um, I think Richard, like myself, uh, we both really wish we'd been musicians rather than sociologists, yeah. although his cello playing is very superior to my violin playing. But so Richard has uh, a, a particular take on how conflict affects people, which goes beyond the formal issues of democratic institutions. So that's our panel. Uh, and starting with Pauline, I'm going to ask them all to, to address the first question. That is, are the institutions in modern democratic societies, let's not try and talk about the whole world, right? But more, where there are conflicts more horrifying than we encounter at all. Uh, are modern democratic societies developing institutions that are really able to manage the conflicts in them in a creative and fruitful way? Thank Paulina. you. Um, thank you, Colin. Um, for me, when it comes to reflecting on the relation between institutions and conflicts, the first thing I'm thinking about is what kind of conflicts. Um, because it is one thing to um, speak about um, ideological conflicts that could be negotiated through a party system. Um, it's quite another uh, to talk about conflicts of interest, where again, rules or procedures could be put in place and uh, easily be addressed such conflicts. And then quite an altogether matter to talk about um, conflicts that stem from identities. So the much more uh, constitutive, foundational, and to some extent existential conflicts, uh, which I'm not sure how institutions and by institutions here, I understand the whole apparatus of rights, um, citizens, citizenship, uh, equal opportunities, and procedures in place, whether institutions could contain uh, conflicts of that nature. But then again, um, I'm also thinking, how about the cases when institutions are themselves the sites of conflict? And once we start thinking of institutions as being themselves the site of conflict, as we increasingly uh, see today, um, the very concept of conflict for me needs to be further unpacked. And I would distinguish between contests or contestations uh, over uh, institutional practices which are normalized or naturalized. Uh, then I would distinguish between struggles, which could be more ongoing against injustices or inequalities, and um, also um, uh, confrontations, violent confrontations in some cases, which again institutions uh, might not be uh, able to address. So for me, it's, it's a matter, I suppose, um, a starting point for this question is um, what we understand by conflict and then what degree of conflict are we mm. talking about? So. Right, okay. Stretchko. Uh, first of all, I, I'm really glad to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Uh, although I'm sad that Saskia Sassen is he not here, I'm delighted that Richard okay. Sennett jo joined us. Uh, I want to uh, start by something what you said, uh, where I completely agree when you said that uh, we need conflict. Uh, you said something like that. Yeah. Uh, and I think uh, this, this is a crucial uh, thesis, uh, political I would say, uh, in a period where we are faced with something what I would call uh, a hyper-normalization. Uh, what do I mean by that? I'll give you just uh, uh, one small story. Yesterday when I arrived to London, uh, after nine o'clock, uh, I went uh, uh, to the area which is called Knightsbridge, uh, just opposite to Herod's. Uh, there is the Ecuadorian embassy, and I went to visit uh, Julian Assange. Uh, 
whatever you think about Julian Assange uh, uh, and uh, you know his opinions and what he's doing with WikiLeaks and so on, it is a fact which was proved by an institution called the United Nations uh, that he is arbitrarily detained. Uh, so he's sitting there in a very small room, smaller than this room, uh, of more than five years in something which can be uh, defined as solitary confinement. Uh, during the US elections, they even took him away, the internet. Uh, so just imagine this five years without sun, without fresh air, uh, under constant pressure. And I think this, is, this could be described as normalization. When you get out of the embassy, uh, then this is the, 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 the moment when you realize that something is wrong with this world. Uh, because you enter into a small Saudi Arabia with uh, golden Lamborghinis and everything, you know, this huge wealth, oh, yeah. and only a few meter, meters away there is someone fighting against this, the, the biggest empire, the US empire, the Saudis, and so on. Uh, and, well, this is perceived as normal. Uh, uh, and incidentally, uh, today in the morning, I went uh, only a few meters away from the Ecuadorian embassy. You still have time tomorrow if you want. Uh, there is a wonderful exhibition of uh, first time ever outside of Italy of Antonio Gramsci's uh, prison notebooks uh, at the Belgrave Square, uh, or Belgrave, I don't know how do you pronounce it here. Uh, I'm from the Balkans, so my English is a bit bad. Uh, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, this is what I call normalization and the problem. You know, a few meters away, there is the exhibition of someone who was imprisoned when he was 35, 34 years old, uh, who died after prison, uh, just because he was a communist and fighting the fascist, he was imprisoned un under a state of uh, emergency. Uh, and today you have a man at the Ecuadorian embassy uh, who is there put forever, and uh, this is normal that you go shopping to Herod's. Uh, so what I want to say by this, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 several meters away you have prison notebooks, and there's the Ecuadorian embassy, but if you go back to Europe, uh, well, uh, after Brexit, I call it like that, although Britain is also part of Europe, of course, you will see that in the cities of Europe, in Berlin, in Paris, uh, in Calais, in Idomeni, in Greece, now not Idomeni anymore, but Thessaloniki and the refugee camps, it became completely normal that on a daily basis we can see refugees all over, uh, that we can see the army instead of the police in front of metro stations, shopping centers, and so on, that we can see in France, for instance, that since November, after the terrorist text 2015, you have a state of exception which recently with the new law Macron implemented became part of the rule uh, that all over Europe you have the state of exception as becoming something normal. Uh, uh, and uh, I think what, that's why I would come back to, to the thesis you put at the, at the beginning. This is why I think we have to insist on conflict. This situation is not normal. The situation that someone is sitting a few meters away here at the Ecuadorian embassy, uh, uh, probably also the next years, this is not normal because he would be extradited to the US and the British government doesn't do anything. They even don't want to say whether he would be extradited or not. It is not normal that we have refugees living basically in concentration camps all over Europe. It is not normal that in Hamburg at the G20, the police was smashing activists who were also peacefully protesting. Uh, uh, it is not normal and I think we need conflict more than ever. Uh, uh, to come back to your question and just to finish with this uh, final note at, uh, at the introduction, well you ask about the institutions. Uh, I think the problem is uh, the institutions are not the solution, the, the, the institutions are part of the problem. You could have seen it with the European institutions, the European Commission basically, uh, also the European Council, how they reacted to the Catalan crisis. You know, Mr. Juncker said that, uh, that the Catalan crisis, Spanish government seizing the public television, police attacking voters and so on, is basically an internal issue for Spain. So how can you believe in European institutions anymore if this is an internal issue that, uh, uh, you know, the leaders of the, whatever you think about the Catalan question, you know, I'm not now speaking whether it's legitimate or not, this doesn't matter. But if people, uh, leaders are imprisoned uh, uh, and the European Commission says that it's an internal matter, we have a big problem with institutions. But we can come later to that. Tariq. <clears throat> um, I think, um, I'm particularly interested in the identitarian dimension of liberal democracies, democracies in general. And this poses a number of challenges um, of a 
um, sort of relevant to conflict, but also to conflict resolution. Um, an immediate challenge it poses is that institutions, and you know, have the phrase institutionalized conflict or managing conflict and so on, are often premised on the idea of interests. Different parts of the population have different interests and how can we manage them? And for the 20th century, obviously, the classical binary was between broadly what we'd call workers and capital. I think, actually, that's a little too simple because it is identities that mediate interests. Certain people can only have certain kinds of interests because we recognize them as working class or as consumers or as city dwellers and so on. The particular identities I'm interested in are identities that are new or were previously marginal but are now either refusing to stay marginal or it's very difficult to find both the means but also the legitimation to keep them marginal. And so this poses a challenge for a system that has been structured along a limited number of identities, privileging some, uh, highlighting some, marginalizing others, but now having to deal with either new identities or identities asserting themselves in new ways. And I'm particularly interested, I mean, obviously there's a whole range of such kind of identities, and I think of them as, as very much as kind of emerging from what at least we used to refer to as the, the new social movements of, from the 1960s and 70s. But I'm particularly interested in the ones that have arisen in countries like ours through immigration and post-immigration. By post-immigration, I mean settlement over a period of time, so including second generation, third generation, and, and so on. And those identities um, can be either unfamiliar or challenging, perhaps even threatening, to some people in society. Those people might be the institutional managers, but they can also be the wider public and so on. So I'm very interested in how uh, institutions, and not just institutions, I've got to say publics and polities in general, learn about new identities. How do they learn what is the new identity. And a concept that's very much influenced me uh, in this respect is Charles Taylor's concept of recognition and its opposite, misrecognition. Understanding a group of people, of course, he was particularly concerned about Quebecers being understood or recognized by the rest of Canada as a people and not just as a province, something I guess that relates to the, the Catalan issue. But I, I'm more interested in the post-immigration identities that have emerged, like black and Asian and British Indian and Muslim, British Muslim and so on, and how these evolve, but also how the rest of society, including its political institutions, learns what these identities are and what kinds of adaptations and accommodations can take place, should take place, and of course, how to manage the conflict, because there is conflict, of course. Identities can clash, but also identities that were previously marginal and are trying to become non-marginal, that can certainly lead to instability and uh, conflict. Sometimes it can be a discursive political conflict, but of course it can also be uh, conflict in the form of public disorders, threats of um, assassination to authors and cartoonists, um, and we've also uh, seen international terrorism. So, um, and then just finally, of course, in the last few years, we've seen a development which I think is linked to what I've been describing so far, but is a kind of, as it were, turns a corner and that is the emergence 
at least in their self-professed claims, the emergence of majoritarian identities as claiming to be marginalized or devalued and wanting to reassert what they see as their central place, which is being displaced. So wanting to repossess the, the center and repossess the country for themselves and so on, leading to very difficult problems for democracies where majorities are willing to undermine representative institutions and all the checks and balances of liberal democracies like an independent judiciary, like the judgment of elected parliamentarians and so on, where you know judges are called enemies of the people and prefer to put power in the hands of a authoritarian swaggering leader. I think that's another uh, challenge to democracy and a very present one and one fraught with conflict. Thank you, Tariq. Richard. Uh, well, I, I want to talk about one institution, uh, which is the city, and talk about it from, just briefly from a particular point of view. Uh, I'm one of the uh, chairs of something uh, called Habitat 3, which is a once every 20 years uh, uh, meet, a set of meetings sponsored by the United Nations on the state of the built environment. And one of the issues that was very much on our minds was the fact that uh, uh, sometimes called the Smyrna problem after uh, the city of Smyrna in which people of different uh, 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 ethnicities and religious confessions lived for generations together and would then suddenly explode and would be, their neighbor became intolerable. And this is a phenomenon that worried us in places like Mumbai, in which uh, the relations between Muslims and, uh, and uh, Hindus uh, was for generations uh, fairly stable and, and then could explode uh, suddenly. And we asked ourselves, is there anything that we as urbanists could do about the problem of, of difference uh, uh, spiraling into conflict, where differences suddenly become intolerable? to a people, to in a city. The answer we took is very different from, I think, the discourse we've had here, because we were looking at ways in which nonverbal uh, change might deal with this, pro this Smyrna problem of difference spiraling into unbearable, uh, an unbearable situation, which uh, sparks violence. We ask ourselves, for instance, uh, in place of the classic public spaces where differences in the city mix, which are markets, should we be designing um, spaces of mixture of a different sort uh, in schools, in health clinics, and above all, in housing? All of these are extremely difficult. They're fraught because they are bringing the fact of difference into a much more intimate realm mm. than you would have in a market. And the kind of counterfactual that we were dealing with is whether by making uh, the experience of otherness and difference more intimate, we might, there might be a path to making it less explosive. Next month, you'll be able to read um, uh, our conclusions, uh, this is a three-year project, uh, which is published by Rutledge uh, December 1st, I hope, uh, and it's a group of s several hundred people actually involved in this research. And we found, uh, both through some practical experiments in making schools and health clinics, 
that the counterfactual is actually correct. That if we move away from classic public realms into new kinds of public realms, that it seems to be more tolerable for people to, uh, who are different to be together. I'd like to just say one final personal thing about this, not as part of the UN, which is, uh, it's quite true what Barack Obama uh, says, that nobody is born prejudiced. It's quite true. But I've come to believe that if it's not a congenital, congen congenital, it's at least a chronic disease that once they experience the adverse experience of, uh, of, of uh, rejecting the other is there, that there is no single solution to it. It's something that stays with people inside them. And my view about this, both of the work that we've been doing, but I think more generally here, is that there is no cure for this adversive chronic disease once you've caught it. All we can do is give periods of remission <laughs> rather than look for a, certainly a policy cure. And the work that we've been doing is saying that remission is more possible in a non-discursive environment in which physical presence uh, is up close than to seek a remission which is made through, as we classically do, through some kind of verbal arrangement which defines a political policy. So, I, I don't, it's, as I said, I'm quite on the side of this debate, but I hope this illuminates some aspects of this from looking at one institution in particular, which is the city. Well, thank you, Richard. I want to pick up a theme that both uh, Tariq and Richard have, have used, and, and I also want to see how Paulina and Stretchko respond to it. But they both talked about identities uh, with, of a rather raw kind. Uh, Tariq made an important point when he said that, I'm paraphrasing what you said now, but we used to think our politics was about interests, right? class interests, and, uh, rather rationalistic things. So you might calculate your interests, yes, and so I'm therefore I, I belong here and I don't belong there and these are my opponents. And you, you can reconcile interests. You might some redistribution here, some attack on tax levels here. right? So a rationalistic politics. But, as I think he correctly said, uh, actually interests only really acquired political meaning when they became identities as well. That, that if people felt they belonged to a certain class and they voted for a party that was for that class, they weren't just thinking, oh, if I vote for that party, then taxation levels are going to change that favours people like me. No, it was much more visceral than that. You, you, class was something people felt. Uh, and uh, as, as the barriers between the traditional classes have declined and lost meaning, so the identities around class have become less important in our politics, even if the interest issues have actually stayed there. Instead, we're, we're finding, a, 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 as I, I use the word again, a raw set of identities which are about who you believe you are, um, which, is, which you probably can't change, actually, in a way, if you've got a religious identity or a class identity, you, you, could, you could change it or you could regard it as less important. But things that actually label you, mainly racially, ethnically, nationally, are, are much more... If they become issues of conflict that institutions are not, able, are not managing well, then the, 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 it's much more dangerous. St interestingly and strangely, one of those identities is perhaps the most profound of all, which has produced politics, has not really produced political conflict of that kind, and that's gender. 
probably because, for the most part, men and women live together. And so a really aggressive gender party that was hostile to the other gender would be very difficult to manage with family life. Whereas you can say, I'm a Muslim and I only talk to Muslims and that my whole life is in a Muslim community, right? So uh, gender is, is this fundamental identity that is, is the dog that doesn't bark, really, in terms of real political conflict. We've got fascinating gender politics, but it never really appears as dangerous conflict. Meanwhile, uh, as we, we, we've not only had a decline of the great identities of, on which our party systems were based, which are basically class and religion, so the 19th and early 20th centuries give us these two great issues. They have declined in importance for all sorts of reasons, except for religion in the United States, which is a different story. Uh, meanwhile, globalization has brought a whole series of issues about nation and about race. Globalization bringing much more contact with other countries, bringing people from different cultures, mixing much more uh, than perhaps they did in the recent past, um, has brought this set of issues much more prominent in our lives. Now, are our present political institutions able to manage and cope with these things. A few years ago, in several countries, I think we would have quite confidently said, yeah, we're coping with this. I think in this country, 20 years ago, the Netherlands, Sweden, uh, United States, in, its, in a rather different way, we'd have said, yeah, we, we, we're becoming multicultural, we, we, we've got a lot of immigrants, uh, but we're, we're managing this. Um, I remember watching over the years, during my lifetime, that the, the West Indian uh, and Indian and Pakistani immigrations arrived. And for a long while, you saw people rather separate. And then, then you would see <coughs> married couples uh, with children, black and white. At football grounds, you'd see groups of friends together, black and white. And you think, oh, yeah, we're mastering this. We're getting, we're getting on top of this now. And I think certainly the Dutch had the same feeling, the Swedes had the same feeling. Uh, we don't feel so confident about that at the moment. Um, Could I say so, something? Yeah, you, you, which, you, yeah. Which actually, I th it's to disagree with something that you right. said, and that if it was true what you'd said, which I don't think it is, then we wouldn't be able to manage. Mm -hmm. And you said, well, actually, we have an identity and we're kind of given it and we can't mm. change it. Mm. No, I don't think that's right at all. We shouldn't think like that. If we did have identities like that, and sometimes we do, mm. by we I mean people, yeah. we would be like in the former yeah. Yugoslavia or Smyrna and so yeah. on. If we're thinking about the countries that you've just mm. mentioned, Britain, Canada, yeah. uh, the Netherlands and so on, we're not talking about such hard, monistic, discrete identities. P and people's identities do change and do adapt, partly because of internal change and partly because of forms of living together, mm. forms of coexistence, whether it's you know, social, like some of the things Richard was talking about, neighborhoods, um, people, workplaces and public spaces and so on, or it is sometimes political alliances, um, having shared professional interests, including of course academic interests, but uh, loads of other professions. No, I think identities uh, can become coalitional, they can become multiple, uh, they can, uh, change, as it were, ranked order out of your multiple identities. What I would say is that some people who talk about multiple identities are too unrealistic about how the world, like countries like Britain are, when they think, oh, we just have so many multiple identities and they're fluid and you just wake up and you just choose which identity you want and so on. That is only true for a very small number of people and it's only true if there aren't any real social pressures holding you down. People who tend to have harder identities or a smaller palette of identity choices are people who usually are in a state of conflict, partly sometimes because they're fighting against racial exclusion. 
They are trying to find a space for themselves in their society, in our country, in public affairs, and so on. And if their identities seem, either to themselves or to others, to be rather monistic, it's actually because they're being boxed into their identities by social forces. So I think it'd be quite wrong to say, oh, we all have an identity, we all have to live it, and occasionally, like billiard balls, we clash with another identity. No, it's, it's far more um, uh, about uh, interaction and change and a, about an ecology of unequal identities. Yes, that's how I felt a few years ago, but I'm just wondering, is that starting to fail now? Uh, are the billiard balls coming back? That's, that's my worry. But, Stretchka, what do you think about that issue? Uh, I... Well, to, to, to be completely straightforward, uh, what I think is that uh, I think we would all agree on the diag diagnosis, but I'm not sure if you will agree on, on the analysis, uh, what I will say, but I think we all agree that we witness today uh, in the United States, uh, all across Europe, a uh, return to identitarian politics. Uh, you, we, you could have seen it with Brexit here, you could, you could have seen it uh, with Trump, America first, which means that everyone is going back uh, to the nation state in a way and to, to the national identity as well. Uh, you have new walls, uh, you have the suspension of Schengen and so on. So this is the, the diagnosis. But what I think is uh, the reason for this, I'm not sure whether we would agree, uh, but I think it uh, uh, brings us back uh, precisely to the, what I would call the decay of existing institutions. And this is not something what I invented. If you read the last work of Francis Fukuyama, uh, you will see that he says that the biggest threat for liberal democracy is the decay of, of existing institutions, the corruption inside of the institutions, uh, the, the inexistence of accountability and so on. So it is Francis Fukuyama who says that, you know? And we are not really, you know, me and Francis uh, sitting on the same chair. <laughs> uh, and you could have seen it, and I think this brings us back uh, actually uh, to the period of uh, when Antonio Gramsci was imprisoned. And I think this is a very important lesson for the times of today. Let's put it like this. What you could have seen, uh, for instance, uh, I'm speaking about it because I was there and I saw it uh, at the G20 this summer in Hamburg, you could have seen that the existing institutions represented by the so-called uh, uh, leaders of the free world uh, Angela Merkel, Emmanuel Macron, and Theresa May, so that were the leaders of the free world. Uh, uh, these existing institutions uh, uh, had meetings with authoritarian leaders and proto-fascist leaders, such as Erdogan, uh, Trump, even the Saudis. And what, what did they do? Instead of fighting against them, they were listening together at the ELP uh, Philharmonie, uh, you probably, Richard and you also knows this magnificent uh, 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 place, you know, for music and so on. They were listening to Beethoven, to the official anthem of the European Union, which says, Alle Menschen werden Brüder, uh, all people become brothers, you know. So they were listening to that. At the same time, I was together with people who were protesting it in, in the neighborhood of San Pauli, who were tear gassed, uh, helicopters, drones were flying, and so on. And this brings me back uh, to the period of Gramsci, you know, because I think we are repeating history here. We are living in this sort of what Gramsci called in his prison notebooks interregnum, uh, where the old world is dying and the new world cannot be born yet, uh, where if you, if you look what happened with Gramsci and then also with the Weimar Republic in Germany, it is precisely what is happening today. Of course, with differences and new forms because of technological developments and so on, uh, which is the situation that you have existing institutions. Uh, take the Weimar Republic, for instance, uh, there is a wonderful TV series recently launched uh, called Babylon Berlin uh, by Tom Teichler, and I uh, suggest you all to watch it. It's brilliant because it shows precisely this period, uh, 29, where you have the democratic institutions, like we have today, the democratic institutions of Macron, Merkel, and Theresa May, uh, who are, uh, uh, instead of listening to the requests and criticism of the workers who, who, who ask for more rights, of the communists at that time, who were of course influenced by Russia and so on, uh, uh, but it doesn't matter in this perspective, 
instead of listening to them, instead of giving some, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, admissions to them or, or applying some of the requests, they were smashing them the same way as, as the leaders of the free world were smashing protesters uh, uh, at the G20. And they actually brought to the rise of Nazism in, in Germany and the same, and the same thing in, in, in Italy. You know, the biggest enemies uh, of the democratic institutions before Mussolini came to power were the communists. And the same happened in Weimar Republic. So I think we, we, we have this kind of scenario today where the existi existing institutions, instead of stopping the past of a new fascism which will acquire new forms, of new concentration camps which will acquire new forms, instead of stopping this, preventing this, they're fueling it. Uh, uh, so uh, I, I'll give you just a few examples. Uh, take the US, uh, US elections. You, what you can see now with uh, uh, Dona Brazil, with, with the big scandal, what WikiLeaks already uh, uh, revealed uh, before, uh, uh, is that it is the Democrats who, before Trump became candidate, they picked up three possible candidates and they said Trump would be the ideal candidate because he cannot win. You know, that you can find in the, in the, in the, in the leaked emails. So, as a consequence of the Democrats who didn't go for Bernie Sanders, today you have Donald Trump. I mean, that's one of the reasons. So, what I'm saying is that the existing institutions and the elites are completely failing because all of the time they're picking the wrong side, the same as they did in Weimar Republic, the same as they did in Italy before the rise of Mussolini. So, I think what we have to do today uh, is uh, to be aware that it is precisely the democratic institutions which might lead us in a new dystopia. So if, if we're in an interregnum, what is the new world that's trying to be born? Well, it's is the same, it is the same as then, at that time. Not the same, of course, because it's, so it's, it's a, a dystopian. dystopian. It, it a can dystopian be, no, it can be, it can be both ways. You know, here I'm a historical materialist. Yeah. And I think Walter Benjamin and his thesis on the history of philosophy uh, are more relevant than ever in the sense that uh, it is not, the answer is not given yet. You know, the, 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 it, it's possible to go in any direction as it was possible in 33 or in 44, yeah. you know. Uh, so on the one hand, what you can see is a new world, uh, which is a um, capitalist authoritarian world represented by Trump, Erdogan, uh, uh, Orban, Putin, uh, but it's happening also now in Austria, in Czech Republic, uh, in Germany with, uh, with AfD, uh, which on the one side shows also the deep crisis of social democracy, take the German elections and the votes of SPD, which were lawyers uh, since the Second World War. So this is the one world which we are approaching more and more, but on the other side, there is a new world as well, which is trying to be born. Uh, you have it here in Britain, for instance, uh, 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 with, with the Labour Party, uh, which is also an attempt to recreate the Labour Party uh, 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 completely differently with momentum and so on. You have DiEM25 in Europe, which is Actually, today it was decided that it will probably contest European elections as the first transnational political party in Europe, which didn't exist yet. So this is also a new world which is being born at the moment. Uh, 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 you have different new worlds, for instance, the cooperatives and communes in Catalonia, uh, alternative markets uh, and solidarity movements in Greece, for instance. But the problem is that these new worlds are not connected yet in the way they could be connected, and that what we are missing is a new global transnational institution, uh, uh, which doesn't exist at the moment, uh, after the decline of the non-aligned movement, uh, uh, the impotence of the United Nations, uh, when it comes to climate change, if you want, when it comes to the refugee crisis. So what I think what we have to recreate, on the other hand, if you have uh, uh, an austerity international, represented by, uh, by Merkel, Macron, you have seen the labor reforms in France now, uh, and the fascist international or the authoritarian international, the only answer can be a radical progressive international to that. So I think what we are seeing now is what we have seen uh, in the period of the Weimar Republic, what we have seen with the G20 as well, to finish with this, is that this seeming contradiction between the austerity international and, and the authoritarian international, this is, these are two parts of the same coin. These are two parts of the same coin. It is the austerity international which is reinforcing the authoritarian forces, uh, uh, and the only solution can be uh, on, on another side. So the austerity international is not an answer to the authoritarian and fascist international. The only answer is a new international, if you want it like that. 
Well, Sretsko said that we might agree on the diagnosis, mm -hmm. but perhaps not on the analysis and the solution. That's probably right. So I would yep. say that the, the division that you um, uh, define, you know, that's in front of us now, I would put it in these ways, which aren't the same as yours, but perhaps aren't too different. But then I think I would offer a different kind of uh, direction that we should go in to what you were saying. So I think the challenge before us is um, when, when I first spoke, I, I finished off by saying we now have this new kind of rise of a kind of majoritarian uh, identity movement or movements. Um, let's put them together and call them majority nationalisms because most of them are focused around a kind of renewal of the national idea, which is exactly as Sarechko said. But you think that the, what we have to posit against that is some kind of internationalization, um, which is lacking at the moment, or we have a, a kind of bad internationalization and we need a progressive internationalization. I'm not, I'm not convinced by that because I think that um, that national identities do matter to people and they don't just matter to proto-fascists or people who can be persuaded to vote for fascists in the way that you were describing. Um, they matter to all kinds of people, including, if we look at this country, including ethnic minorities who survey after survey finds um, are more affirming of a British identity, albeit a hyphenated British identity, like, you know, black British, British Muslim, and so on, and who say in polls that they have more trust in British institutions, despite various kinds of real policy conflict, especially around, you know, foreign policy and de-radicalization and uh, related policy areas like that. So I think we actually Instead of telling people your sense of national identity is the problem, we need to say, of course, people have a sense of national identity, mm -hmm. but there can be, it can take abusive and illiberal forms which are divisive because they stigmatize and exclude <coughs> parts of the national population, part of, parts of the national citizenship. So what we need to come up with are inclusive, multicultural nationalisms. Not a critique of the national identity, but a repossession of the national identity for the more plural, progressive direction. And to do that, we need to show that we sympathize and understand the sensibilities and frustrations of the kind of people who, some of, at least some of the kinds of people who voted for, say, Trump and Brexit and who are kind of emerging with this kind of resentful, sullen English nationalism, that we understand that. We don't think that the politics that's uh, it's, um, being directed to at the moment, <coughs> expressing itself at the moment, is the right politics because it'll actually divide the nation and we are committed to uh, uniting a, and in some ways remaking a plural national identity that all who are citizens in that country can have a sense of belonging to. And I think that, to be quite honest, is the only feasible way of defeating majoritarian nationalism by offering a more progressive nationalism, not by attacking people for having a sense of national identity. But, Paulina. one second, why do you see this as a national, uh, mm. an issue which has to do with national uh, identities? Because you seem, it seems to me that you talk about different things, and I'm not sure. Personally, I don't, uh, of course identities are there, they have always been. 
And of course there's conflict between identities and differences, but at the same time for me, there is a moment between asserting or being with your identity and then uh, coming into conflict with the other. And this is not just about identities or just about differences. There is a moment and there is an event at some point which happens. So that's in terms of the general frames, which then moved into national identities. And I don't even see uh, Brexit or Trump uh, as an attempt to reassert a national identity either. It's a discourse. Sure. For me, it's a discourse which at some point in time, there was a referendum, was successful, but I don't necessarily want to take it back to a national issue. Of course, there are other issues. There is privilege or uh, lack of it, which uh, kind of uh, are important here. So I'm not sure the frame of the discussion, I'm yeah. actually um, following it. Mm, that sense, yeah. I was going to say, Shrekha, that I, I, think, I, I think about this in a very different way, that the preconditions for fascism, uh, to be susceptible to fascism, are that people have lost a kind of capacity to believe that they themselves can manage complexity. And that by simplifying the terms, whether it's national, whatever, but that by simplifying the terms of their existence, they will re, re-empower themselves. And uh, it's, people who are confident that they can manage complexities are not going to fit in to, to a kind of fascist framework of a susceptibility to it. The other thing I'd say about this, I, I don't know how you feel about this, to me, the notion of of having a class identity is a double thing. On the one hand, you take a kind of, you experience that class identity very personally, and you also feel that there is a judge, an elite, who is looking at the way in which you have personalized your material circumstances and said, you failed. And that's why you become resentful and angry. Certainly that's the case in the U.S., that the, those worker, white workers who voted for Trump, and they're not a majority of white workers, but those workers who did, uh, when I listened to them talk, and I, I wrote a book about this a long time ago called The Hidden Injuries of Class, and I, I, what I observed in a different generation, I felt again with this, that they are people who feel not that the elite is privileged, but the elite is sitting in a kind of judgment on ordinary people who are themselves personalizing uh, their own experience of material conditions. These are very different than nationalists. They, it takes a kind of nationalist discourse. You're absolutely right about that. But there's something inside human beings who are put in that position that makes them feel they can't cope and somebody else, this thing that we would call the elite, has found them out and is judging them and is shaming them. Yeah. I, I, just, I, just don't, I, I just don't see that the fact of feeling a national identity as you say this, is inevitably something that will lead somebody into succumbing to fascism. Does that make any sense to me? We've got a lot of themes running around here now, and there's no way we're going to wrap this up. <laughs> At the risk of making it much more complex, can I invite anyone out there <laughs> in the audience to, to, to contribute, not necessarily to ask a question, you might want to ask a question, any one of us, but just to, con- to make a contribution to to these debates about what's happening with conflict. Yeah. Um, I I had a question about identities seems to do a lot of work for everyone on the panel. And I I had two questions. One is, I worry that there's a slightly elitist thing going on with the stupid people with their identities, whether they're majoritarian or nationalist or whatever, and how we need to create new identities for them in nice and caring ways. 
So that's my first point, is how does that work in a discussion around democracy? And secondly, what would happen if actually there was a crisis of identity, that people no longer really knew what it meant to be American or European or British or gendered, and really politics and conflict revolved around the sort of not in my name, and I'm oh. not joining the party, and my identity is yeah. obviously always going to be a disruptive one and against identities. It Good seems that this discussion could have, is like Good one from 20 years ago, where you all take identities for granted and it becomes some managerial question. Um, so I'm a bit surprised about it, that's, that's all. Yeah. Good I thought Paulina did something. She said it was a discourse, which, which actually relativizes the whole idea. Once you say it's a discourse, so there can be other discourses. Why is this one dominant? What, what, how do you challenge it? Because it's constructed. Yeah, and they're constructed. Was, <laughs> and it was right. constructed it to an extent, institutionally constructed as yeah. well. Yeah. So if you don't look at these moments where a discourse is constructed around identity, then perhaps we cannot understand the conflicts which, in retrospect, we attribute back to identities. But for me, the starting point is difference, is not identity. So for me, it's about pluralism and visions of difference rather than uh, identities, which could be quite essentialized. I'm a little bit at a loss when you say it's a discourse. Yes, it's a discourse. But so what? What isn't a discourse? I mean, it's not like, oh, you were talking about identities, I'm talking about discourse. That, I don't find that particularly illuminating. I was talking about identity discourses, so you say, oh, don't talk about identity, talk about discourse. And then your next step is, uh, discourses are constructed. Well, of course they must be, they don't drop out of the sky. All our discourses must be constructed. Yeah, but no, when it comes no to... particular discourse is better or worse than another for being constructed. Yes, but when it comes to collective identities, uh, there is more work at play here rather than individual identities where you can define yourself as who you are and how you relate to the world, to the world out there. So when you have never met the people whom you claim to share an, or others claim to share an identity, some work is being done, and for me that's... Yeah, and it uh, must be done. It's, it's not like, oh, some work is being done and this is a discovery because they were trying to hide it. Some work must be done. We must create common identities. That's what I meant when I said mm -hmm. we must come up with an alternative progressive nationalism by making identities, not by kind of just some kind of introspective action by collectively talking, arguing, um, putting up candidates, um, coming up with manifestos. You know, I mean, it requires all kinds of political activity. So that's why I don't see that the alternative to, as it were, identitarian talk is discourse and the fact of agency. No identity can exist without agency and without um, some kind of field, a relational field in which it relates to other identities and to the dynamics of change. But Can most I... of the time that the identity is used politically, it's not presented as constructed and as discourse, it's presented as blood and soil uh, uh, and something that's got a prior primeval reality to it. And it well, it's I would like to see the evidence is. for that. Well, just listen to them. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't think it's obvious from just listening. So when the British talk about British identity, they're not thinking this is a nation state that actually has its present boundaries dating back only to 1922. They think they're talking about something else. Yeah, but I mean, of course it has a historical existence that's more than just its present boundaries because its yeah, yeah. boundaries can shift. Yeah. But a country can't just be defined by... Um, you know, small boundary changes. I mean, look, you you have a plot of land on sits your house and your garden, mm. and I know you like gardening. Supposing, supposing your neighbour um, said, "Oh, I'm fed up with uh, this little bit of tract of land between our two gardens. Would you like to have it?" You said, "Oh, I'd love to because I love gardening." So you extend your garden by an extra, you know, ten yards. You wouldn't now say. 
oh, I'm living in a different place because the boundaries changed. You can't define your house and garden simply by a small extension of the boundary. So of course we're talking, if we're talking about Britain, mm. before that, you know, England and a separate Scotland mm. and so on, we're talking about obviously a very long history in which there's been enormous amount of change, but we couldn't say the country only exists from 1922. No, no could, could, um, could I respond sorry, to, yeah, this, yeah, to this? Yeah. Your, your question is, is a really good one. And I think that it, but it goes beyond, I would say it goes in a different direction than the discussion that they're having. And, uh, it, sorry. The two of them, you mean. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and it's, um, I'm very sensible to what you say. It poses a question about how much human beings can live with the fact of ambiguity mm. and feel that they have a life narrative. Mm. Do you understand what I mean? That we all feel ambiguity all the time, but the question for me in this is how does that relate to the sense of being, living out either constructed or ascribed or however, the sense of living out a, a narrative in time that you have a personal history. If you arrive at the end, if you arrive at my age, my elderly age, and say, well, it was all a muddle, you know, you're not so happy. Do you know what I mean? So there is a way in which this is, I think it's a question that needs to be resolved in some way in time. Hmm. Anyone else want to come in on this? Yeah. Wait, there's a microphone. I'd like to return the provocation on the topic of gender. I don't know whether that was perceptible on stage, but there was an interesting ripple in the audience when the claim was made that gender really hasn't ever emerged as a major source of conflict. Um, now, it might be challenging to organize a general strike with 50% of the population, but I, I'd say there have been other forms of contestation involving gender and that in fact today gender is re-emerging quite powerfully as um, an axis of contestation, not least because of, and I use this term quite deliberately, rather hysterical manifestations of masculinity that are part of the proto-fascisms that are being discussed. So um, I don't particularly care who would like to address this, but I don't think we could leave gender just out of the discussion. No, I meant it's not been the basis of political parties, except in very marginal cases. But I just meant that specific point. Anyone else want to respond on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I do agree. I did pick up this point as well, but I thought, okay, I had other things to say as well. Uh, yeah, I think gender is important, and, um, but also what is interesting today in these discussions is uh, discussions about transgender rights as well, which is coming back and also makes very alive the issue of institutions and conflicts. So gender certainly both uh, uh, in the tra traditional sense, well, female gender, male, uh, is there and it yes. is uh, re-emerging and also um, current discourses about transgender rights uh, or a genderless even uh, world is quite interesting in terms of the identifying uh, to an extent or encouraging uh, debates about not our fixed or set identities, but yeah, that's all. Yeah. I agree that you are, we've, we're definitely looking at people who are not of a fixed gender, but for me what's concerning is that if we stop thinking about gender now, as the world is moving more and more into fundamentalism, and more and more into a sense that we're gonna lose what we've created with gender equality, and question mark at that point, you know, how much have we really got gender equality, but it's definitely better than it was. We're about to lose it as more and more fundamentalism arises. Anybody else like to come in? Yeah. 
We wait for the microphone. This is. Oh yeah, you can. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I was very struck by your comment that um, sorry of uh, Mr. Horvath. Uh, hypernormal is the new normal, or in a way, hypernormality. Well, you said it much more eloquently, but that, well, that I, don't, thing, I don't remember as well. It was so but, brilliant that I don't remember. But, uh, <laughs> so just as a simple historian, my question is: When was normal? Maybe it leads us down a path of cynicism, because there never was normal, but mm. from your view, where do you see escalation happening historically? And maybe just a wider point to the panel, if we talk about identities, and it's a fascinating discussion, there is a lot to say, again, a simple historian's question, it's a lot of a 20th century discussion that we're having in the 21st century about fascism and ideologies and politics and institutes. I miss words like sustainability, resources, cooperation, so, although I like the need for conflict to settle these things in democracy, I wonder also what's your views on that. Uh, yeah, let, yeah. Let, let me respond to your question, but also to some things which were just said here and completely agree with, uh, with your point about gender, uh, uh, which brings me actually to your question. Uh, I didn't speak so much about normality or something like that, because it could go back to Michel Foucault and, you know, all this uh, philosophical reading of uh, what normal actually means. Uh, look at the history of madness by Foucault, so you will see that normal is actually something which is very, very often imposed. So I, didn't, I wasn't talking about this, I was talking about the process of normalization, uh, 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 which will bring it back to gender and this uh, 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 hyper-masculinity, masculinity which we can see all over, which is not just masculinity, but a sort of political economy, actually, uh, and a sort of new totalitarianism, I would say, which is being born as we speak. Uh, uh, let me put it like this. What do I mean when, when I talk about normalization? I don't know how many of you have read uh, uh, the wonderful book by Imre Kertes, uh, Faithlessness. Yeah. Uh, and if you remember the last chapter, the last chapter, uh, the small uh, Georgi, uh, 15 years old, uh, uh, which is basically Imre Kertes, who also spent, uh, uh, who, was, who survived several concentration camps, mm -hmm. gets out of the concentration camp. Uh, he's on a tram wagon in Budapest, returns home, uh, and uh, how do you call it? A conductor comes and says, Kid, do you have a ticket? And he says, I don't have a ticket. And he says, But how do you? How do you look? Did you come from a concentration camp? And you know what Georg answers? Normally. Uh, then this guy, the conductor, which later we find out he's actually a journalist writing about concentration camps, uh, 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 asks him, but how could you say uh, normally uh, 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 and naturally that you came from the concentration camp? And then Kertes gives something which I think is a, is, is a wonderful uh, uh, explanation of what normalization means. He said that the concentration camps uh, were being felt as something normal uh, at that time, and that the process of normalization, which I think is a very uh, important political lesson, which was happening through steps, which brings me back to, to, to gender. Uh, he describes it as this. Before I ended up in the concentration camp, I was in a row of 1,000 people waiting from a wagon uh, embarking to Auschwitz. And I could count in these 20 minutes that each, I was aware of each step I was making, each step was bringing me into the, into the concentration camp. And uh, uh, if we speak about gender, thanks for posing this question, uh, uh, don't you have something very similar today? Uh, uh, you know, just remember when uh, Donald Trump was elected, the Women's March, and uh, a sign which was present at the protest uh, against uh, Donald Trump, which said, make Margaret Atwood fiction again. Why this sign? Because if you read Handmaid's Tale or watch the TV series, you will see that this process of uh, 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 turning women in second, third, 10 rate uh, uh, citizens, you know, who don't have any property rights anymore, is also happening step by step. In Handmaid's Tale, first what you do, you take the property rights of the women. Then what you do, you block the accounts of women so they don't have rights anymore. It functions through political economy as well. So I think this is crucial that what we are witnessing today is a process of normalization of things which are not normal. Because it is not normal that we have more than one million refugees fleeing from Syria and we treat it as a sort of refugee crisis. No, it's not a fucking refugee crisis, it's a humanitarian crisis. 
it's a consequence of capitalism, which brings me back to you, because I think alternative, uh, how did you call it, alternative, uh, alter, alternative progressive nationalism. Yes, I'm very well aware that uh, nationalism in Algeria or where I come from in Yugoslavia with the partisan struggle had an emancipatory, emancipatory character, you know, the Yugoslav partisans used the, the, the future Yugoslav society, not Serbia, Slovenia or Bosnia or something like that, but something they were going to build as this nationalism, you know, what you speak about that it can be progressive. Yes, it can at that point, but it came out of class struggle. So what I'm missing here when we speak about identity is class identity, because I think the only way we can reach a more equal solidarity society and so on is through class struggle and class identity. And uh, one, last, one last point about nationalism. Uh, uh, we're living in the 20, 21st century. Uh, to me, any retreat to the classical notion of the nation state uh, is not only passé, but dangerous. Uh, take the example of Catalonia today. What I think we have to do instead of playing this false dilemma game between uh, whether we support the Catalan referendum or we support the Spanish uh, 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 state or we, or we support Juncker if anyone supports Juncker, uh, what we have to do instead of that I think is to redefine identity as such completely on new radical foundations that we have to do, that we have to use the Catalan crisis to redefine what sovereignty means. So in my imagination, and it, if we are living in the 21st century, why wouldn't we imagine a Europe where you have an independent Catalonia, where you have an independent Barcelona, where you have rebel cities like Naples with Luigi de Magistris, Barcelona like with Ada Colau, uh, Porto Alegre with participatory budgeting, where people have their class identities because they can participate in participatory budgeting and they don't give a damn about their uh, being Brazilian or being Spanish and so on, and that this sovereignty is interconnected, but I come back to the importance of internationalism because I think if you have what Bernie Sanders now called uh, as, a, as a response to the Paradise Papers, an international oligarchy, I think the only answer can be radical internationalism. If capital is international, the only answer can be not micro communities, you escape, you build an island and so on, or a nation state. Uh, look at Britain, Brexit, you know, well, what is going to happen after Brexit? You know, you think that uh, Britain, Britain was never, never an island and will never be an island, you know? Even if you retreat to the nation state, to the, 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 the identity of Britain. Well, just to I finish, just to finish, what I think we have to do is that you can, you, you have to use political imagination in this, I'm not saying that you're not using it, but all of us have to use political imagination in the sense that you can imagine that there is a Europe where there is an independent cities, independent from Silicon Valley, from the concept of smart cities, Google, Airbnb, Uber, and so on, independent from the Spanish state or from European Union, which didn't allow the Adapolao government to bring refugees in. It is because of the democratic institutions no, of, of the European Union and, and Spain, which would be interconnected on the European level by a new concept of sovereignty which is going beyond the nation-state. I think we need that. Go beyond the well, nation-state. That, <laughs> that was a very long speech and perhaps a popular one, but let me give you a brief response. Class struggle. Well, if we look at this country and we look at our two major parties, I mean, the Labour Party now is an alliance between a divided middle class and a divided working class. The Conservatives are at the moment, especially uh, some of the votes that have been garnered for them in the last few years through UKIP, um, kind of as it were, moving those people to the right. The working class um, uh, vote is divided, uh, you know, in the Conservative Party and allied with a middle class and so on. So, I don't know what you mean by middle class, but it's quite clear that neither party could hope to win um, political power with a majority in parliament and a consensus for action and so on, without not just being a mono-class party. On your point about nationalism being so passe and so on, I just don't see that. I mean, if we just... Try I'm not, not sorry, I'm not second. dismissing nationalism, no. Just, no. no uh, if we just try not to be too theoretical for a moment and just look at what's happening in the world and, of course, lift our eyes up so we're not just looking at the countries closest to our own and our own country. 
nationalism is getting stronger in India, mm. in the Middle East. Mm. But that's what I said in, as well. In, yes, you know? so I thought you were telling me that I was going against the tide and you were going with the tide and all we needed to do was a little bit of imagination and we would be able to help the tide. No, 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 but wait, I don't wait, think... Can I finish? I mean, yeah, yeah, but, a, but you, you mis misunderstood me, you know? Yeah. Well, or I misunderstood you, it's possible as well. Um, so that's my point about nationalism. I think nationalism is a very live force and the complacency about saying, oh, we just need the imagination of something international will not contain the powers of nationalism. We need to defeat nationalism politically by coming up with a better understanding of those people who do have national identities that are important to them. You say, why can't we imagine a world where Brazilians don't care about being Brazilians and so on? We can imagine whatever we like, but the question is, is it politically feasible and is it respectful of our co-citizens or is it trashing the identities and sensibilities that are important to them? Okay, just, just very quickly, uh, you obviously didn't listen to me at the very beginning where I said that it's a big problem that in Czech Republic, in Austria, in Germany and so on and so on and so on, I mentioned all these countries, I didn't mention India, uh, that nationalism is returning. I said that, here we agree. I don't agree that an answer to this nationalism is what you called an alternative progressive nationalism. I think that only progressive internationalism is an answer to nationalism. So we disagree on that. But I don't dismiss that for some people national identity is important. But instead of Germans, you know, retreating to the, Ger the German workers, uh, going against the Greek workers on the basis of nationalism, I would like to see them united in the class struggle. I'm sorry for using class struggle uh, at the British Academy. I thought Academy. you wanted them to be united as Europeans. There's, there's another hand yeah, it's the same. over there. It's Let's the same. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll, Europe no. is just a single class. I want, no, I want to take another question. I just wanted to step in and say that arguments around identity and nationalism might be a bit irrelevant at this point. Um, I think, can you use the mic? No, okay. Use the mic. Yeah. Here over there. Um, arguments around identity and nationalism might be, as Shrechko said, bit passe at this point. Um, I don't totally agree with the view that nationalism is coming back. I think it's in its, it's in its death throes. It's having its last outburst before it completely dies. Um, if we look around the world, it's not that bad. We can't be that pessimistic. We can go to, you said the Middle East, uh, was a place where nationalism was coming back. Um, I think if we, if we look at movements all across the Middle East, Middle East especially in places like Rojava and Syria, um, that's the complete opposite of what we're talking about. That's what DM25 talks about. Um, it's, it's not as bad as we might think. Nationalism, in a sense, isn't coming back in the way that we saw it in the 30s. It's a different type of sort of cheap, shallow, su superficial nationalism. It's not really a, a solid, maybe in a theoretic, theoretical sense. And also, if we look at other case studies, DM25 being one of them, we're doing okay, it's, it's long, <laughs> but there is hope. It's not just some, it's not nationalism coming back, we can't do anything about it, let's wait another 70 years and see what's happened, what, what will happen. But there are many examples of what can happen um, if we shape you know, the discourse. Um, so yeah, um, from my humble opinion, conflict, coming back to conflict and democracy, which seemingly we haven't really talked about, despite it being called conflict and democracy. Uh, conflict, well, in the way we see it today, might have to go back to the anarchist definition of conflict and take conflict as an entirely positive thing. Um, conflict doesn't just mean disagreement, and or some people might take it as violence. Conflict is, can be a positive thing, and only through conflict can we achieve a consensus which will lead to, which will lead to successful democracy. Uh, conflict, well, between two sides will bring a consensus. Disagreement is not a bad thing. As long as there's no violence or um, it's aggression or, um, let's see, uh, what do you call it, interests at the heart of conflict, then it's fine. But it has to be open conflict. And that's what we see in, in places such as Rojava, as we see in Europe. It's, or like dialogues at the G20. 
in between progressive or radical spaces, we can see open conflict and open dialogue, which is actually quite successful and can lead to new progressive solutions, not progressive nationalism, which would actually be quite damaging. But yeah, that's my thought. As a 17-year-old, that's what I could think of. That's a very positive note, but I think I ought to end with just the last word from the panel members. But at risk of opening a can of worms, <laughs> Uh, most of us here, and probably some of you, have used the first person plural, who said, we must do, we ought to. Who are we in the sense of competent agents who might be able to do anything about all of this? Richard, who are we? Well, I'm not going to answer that question. <laughs> But I am going to respond to uh, your wise beyond your years. Uh, I, w I would say about the ex what I know about the experience of conflict is that when it's verbalized, uh, there is a danger that it becomes the verbal object itself becomes something to defend, the verbalization. And uh, just coming back to where, what I was talking about before, that's why in, when we're working practically in these cities, we're trying to keep people away from that. If they feel adverse reactions to people unlike themselves, that they're not forced to define what it is that they feel uh, adverse. There is, I mean, I guess I, I would say that, to you that one of the good uses of conflict is to feel a kind of discomfort with other people without the necessity of formalizing it. It's very difficult, you know, it's a very demanding thing. But if people can do that, if they can resist the notion of saying, this is why I'm uncomfortable, there's more of a space to live with that discomfort uh, than to try and escalate it into something in either me or you kind of relationship. So it's very good. I, I think it's a very realistic comment mm. that, that you make. Mm. Well, will you answer who we are? Uh, no. <laughs> you won't either. No. I, I think um, it's more urgent if I um, use my last couple of minutes to um, reinforce what I'm saying because I, I'm just surprised that people think that nationalism isn't a rising force and is quite thin and superficial. I just don't see that. If we look at all the major countries of the world, each is becoming more nationalist. Mm. China, India, and, and these are the countries that are going to shape Japan. the 21st century, Japan. And, and you say in the Middle East, actually the trend is the other way, it isn't. The Islamism of the Middle East is nearly always either um, a national Islamicist movement, as in, say, uh, you know, Egypt or Tunisia or Turkey, um, or it ends up being a very violent one. And, and so mm. I, I just don't see that these, uh, these nationalist forces are, are about to be easily overcome. So, as a multiculturalist, I take that challenge seriously and I think, is there a way of living with national identities, which I'm not at all against, and I don't, it's not, when I say living with, it's not like, oh, other people want them, so I'll go with them. You know, I have a strong sense of national identity myself. So I think of my, um, how to make multiculturalism and a sense of country become um, fused, cooperative, as it were, partner ideas, as opposed to uh, see them as a kind of uh, zero-sum game. And if you did see it as a zero-sum game, it's obvious that nationalism is going to win. So that would uh, crush out uh, multiculturalism. So I'm very sad to see that even in parts of the world which have a very rich tradition of diversity, mm. like India, mm. you know, of social uh, diversity, cultural diversity, mm. like the Middle East, 
the trend is all in the direction of majoritarian uh, cultural nationalism or religio nationalism. So that is the dominant trend. So as a multiculturalist, I'm trying to rise and respond to that challenge. Obviously not on a totally global level, but let's begin with our own country. I'll give up trying to get people to answer my questions. I'll give Pauline the last word, but Stretchka, do you want to make a final comment? You might actually be willing to say who the agent is. Excuse me? You might be willing to say who we are, or who is the historical subject. <laughs> well, I, I, I could, uh, but... Uh... <laughs> but you don't... And I will, you okay, might. okay. <laughs> I, I, in two, yeah, I'll try in two minutes. Yeah. Uh, and I'll go back uh, to, to a beautiful text uh, written by a French philosopher called uh, Maurice Blanchot in 64, which was the year when Stanley Kubrick uh, did Dr. Strangelove, which was the time of the Cold War, when the nuclear war was threatening and so on, uh, which brings us up to a parallel to, to, to our today moment. And he wrote a text with an ingenious, beautiful title, which is called The Apocalypse is Disappointing, uh, where he answers the question, who are we? So the point of Maurice Blanchot is you have the threat of the bomb with a big B, uh, and uh, uh, the apocalypse is disappointing uh, because uh, it's possible that the world will end, like today. Today we don't have only the bomb, we have uh, an ecological crisis, a potential of civil wars all around the globe and so on. Uh, but it's disappointing because we still didn't succeed to build the totality and the whole which we are going to lose. So that's the reason why the apocalypse is disappointing. So to speak about the we, I think we have to create the we yeah. precisely out of the future, if you want to put it like that. What, what Marx called the poetry from the future. So in the sense that uh, I think that today's predicament, and that's why I'm so glad that I, I, I hear this question where a 17 years old uh, 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 comrade has more hope than most of us in this room, uh, uh, that precisely this situation today, where you have Trump, where you have Erdogan, where you have Modi in India, where you have nationalism rising, where you have a state of exception, that precisely this dystopia is the chance to build the totality and the whole, which we, if we succeed to build it, this we, and this we is a new global community, uh, then we would be able to prevent the apocalypse. So the we comes from the future, that's well, my answer. You did answer it, thank you. Yeah. I often accuse the British people of voting for a better yesterday, but you're, <laughs> you're saying construct the future out of itself. Yes. <laughs> Um, okay, what do you I want don't, to talk about? <laughs> no, I don't feel the need to justify my uh -huh. use of uh, we here, uh, but um, I do agree in terms of projecting to uh, what other world could be there. Um, so for me, to go back to the question of conflict and democracy, of course it matters, but we know that, and we, we've known that for the past at least 10 to 20 years, that conflicts are there in democracy, and we have uh, ac accepted these conflicts. So the question is, what happens after uh, mm. the conflicts we've had and the ones we do have now? Well, to end up with calling, we have post-democracy after the, <laughs> the conflict, right? Yeah, don't stop me. <laughs> uh, well, thank you very much, everyone, for a lively audience and lively panel. Uh, it, we, it was too heterogeneous a debate, really, to focus down, but a lot of, in, perhaps, the parts were greater than the whole. Thank you very much. <laughs>